Hey, it's Tom here and welcome back to the channel. So in this video, I want to cover a topic that I really don't see talked about all that much here on YouTube. And it's basically this idea of a relative return versus an absolute return. So uh, in other words, should you be trying to beat the S&P 500 index, for example, by a certain amount per year, or should you just be focused on earning some percentage rate of return? So forget about what the index does. I just want to do 10% a year or 15% a year or whatever your target number is. So uh, let me kind of start this video off by giving you some kind of hypothetical question. Now, the hypothetical question question is would you rather a beat the s p 500 by three percent a year for uh, the rest of your investment lifetime or would you rather earn 10 percent a year for the rest of your investment lifetime that's the hypothetical and it's one that you have to choose uh, in terms of what return you would rather have now the obvious question here if you were to uh, make an informed decision on that particular question is what is the return of the s p 500 likely to be so is the s p 500 plus three percent going to be higher than the 10 percent alternative or is the S&P 500 only going to earn maybe 3 or 4% a year? So even with that 3% alpha, you're still lagging that 10% hurdle rate. That's basically uh, the thing you have to understand when you want to make a good decision about what has the best investment performance. But uh, the really hard thing in reality is that we have absolutely no idea what the future return of something like the S&P 500 is going to be. You know, we can look back through history and say, you know, over the past 50 years, the S&P 500's done 10% a year, or over the last century, it's done maybe 8% per year, or uh, in New Zealand and Australia, the index has done about 10% a year for the last century. Um, but that really doesn't guarantee any future performance. We've clearly experienced a lot of economic growth. We've squeezed most of the juice out of getting uh, interest rates right down to zero. So there's a lot of good arguments to say that maybe the future returns of an index aren't necessarily going to be as high as they have been in the past. And from just a practical investment perspective, that's really the main reason why I've found myself starting to shift towards more of an absolute return focus. So rather than saying that I want to beat the S&P 500 by a couple of percent per year over my lifetime, uh, rather I am building in some sort of hurdle rate that uh, when I make an investment, I want it to conservatively have prospects to earn uh, at least that amount and ideally much more. And if I can earn that return throughout my lifetime and I run that through a compound interest calculator to see what that sort of final number might look like uh, at the end of my investment lifetime, uh, that by far and away hits any targets I will need to hit in terms of reaching financial freedom. So I really don't have the goal of beating the S&P 500, for example, at least not directly. I think if I can earn 10 to 15% per year in my portfolio, for example, there's a pretty good chance that um, by default I will probably beat an index um, but it's really not what I'm focusing on my focus has shifted a lot towards reaching some sort of absolute return target and when it comes to absolute returns there are basically two different ways that I think about this in my portfolio so uh, in the past you may have heard me talk about Monish Prabhai's framework for cash in his portfolio so trying to figure out how much he should have invested versus how much he should have sitting on the sidelines in cash to make investments should uh, you know companies on his watch list drop to reasonably low prices where again he can get a good return now um, in that framework Monish Barai basically gives these examples of he would invest a certain amount of money if he thought it was a double in three to five years he would invest a little bit more if he thought uh, he had something that could go up three times in the next three to five years and he sort of has these little incremental thresholds until uh, the final bit of the portfolio which he would call very expensive money is invested in any Thing which he thinks can conservatively 5x in the next three to five years so um, you're getting up to very very high rates of return with that last little bit of capital being deployed and that right there is one of the main examples that I use of absolute returns as opposed to relative returns. So if you can invest in something that doubles in the next three to five years, uh, if it takes three years to double, that is a 26% compounded rate of return. If it doubles in five years, that is a 15% compounded rate of return. And if you mix in a few mistakes, of course, that will uh, reduce your rate of return also. So one of the greatest investors of all time, Sir John Templeton, famously said that uh, even the best investment analysts are wrong at least one third of the time. So if we can have some absolute home run investments that earn 20 plus percent a year and mix in some mistakes, we should still have a pretty good compounded rate of return over a long period of time. 
So although that is a focus on earning some sort of absolute rate of return, uh, we are a little bit at the mercy of um, obviously being correct on that investment thesis, um, but also we're a little bit at the mercy of how long it takes the market to uh, sort of realize the true value of that business and kind of close the gap between uh, the price at which we paid and the intrinsic value of the business. We're quite dependent on uh, A, how long it takes that gap to close and B, uh, you know, whether the intrinsic value actually changes over time as well. So hopefully it's also going up a little bit. If we can buy a dollar for 50 cents and that 50 cents goes back up to a dollar and maybe it's actually worth a dollar 20 at that time, it can potentially go up a bit further. So there's a few other things kind of at play when we, when we do that strategy. Um, but we are somewhat at the mercy of the market with that option. Now, the other type of investment that I will make is a purchase into more of a long-term compounder. So um, with these, you know, doubles in three to five years or triples in three to five years, they, these are typically lower quality companies. They're more of a deep value kind of Ben Graham style approach where um, they're not necessarily great businesses that will compound and that you can own for a long period of time, but they do have the characteristics of a good investment, you know, adequate return, margin of safety, all those sorts of things. So um, we do also invest in compounders and uh, a compounder is where the sort of hurdle rate will again really come into play. So for example, one of the businesses that I purchased a couple of years or so ago at this point is a company called Thor Industries. Now, Thor Industries, uh, in my books, is one of these businesses that is sort of a long-term compounder. And please don't take that as a stock tip or recommendation because it's not, just purely using this as an example. Uh, now, if you had bought Thor Industries at IPO and held it through to today, you would have earned uh, something like 12 or 13% a year compounded, uh, plus any dividends, I believe. So it's been a really good long-term compounder and it was a business that I was able to buy into when they were made an acquisition of the Erwinheimer Group, which the market was fairly skeptical on and it really sent the share price down a lot. Uh, I think it peaked out in 2018 at about $150 a share uh, and it went all the way down to uh, certainly less than 40 or 50 dollars per share and even just in march last year it again dropped down to in the 30 dollar per share range so uh, there was a lot of opportunity to buy into a good business that was going through uh, potentially some short-term pain or at least some short-term skepticism about the success of that particular acquisition uh, but nonetheless it came through that period perfectly fine and in fact it's having uh, the best year it has ever had as i make this video right now so when I bought into that particular business, that was a time where I really wasn't looking to buy it at 50 cents on the dollar and sell it at a dollar on the dollar. <laughs> I may still sell Thor Industries at some point if I think the price gets egregious or if um, I need to free up some cash to put into more attractive investments. But my goal right now is to just continue holding that and to kind of let it compound. So um, when I look at that particular investment, I do need to have some sort of hurdle rate at which I would purchase into that company. Company. So um, for me at the time that was about 15% per year. So when I was assessing the intrinsic value of Thor Industries, uh, I wanted to buy it at a price that I could conservatively earn 15% a year. So I was calculating the intrinsic value at the time. Uh, I was using what I viewed as fairly conservative growth rates for Thor Industries moving forward. And then I was also trying to buy it at a big margin of safety to that price. So there's a lot of kind of margin of safety built in right throughout the process. You've got a fairly high discount rate in there of 15%. You've got fairly conservative growth rates. And you're also trying to buy it at a big margin of safety to that value you that you sort of calculate so uh, a lot of things kind of working in your favor which um, most of the time will make it really difficult to buy businesses at those prices because you are being very conservative but also if you can get them they can work out really really well if you're right on your thesis and as it relates to this video, uh, anytime you assess an investment like that, it's pretty much always about absolute returns. I wasn't comparing that necessarily to what I might earn in an S&P 500 index. Rather, I was identifying out of all the businesses that I understood at the time and that were on my watch list, this one was the most attractive to me uh, at the time and it far exceeded that hurdle rate. So if none of the business on my, businesses on my watch list exceeded that hurdle rate, would have been more than happy to just hold on to the cash and kind of keep waiting until I find something. But it did reach that target price. I was comfortable that I could earn a good return and therefore I was happy to put some money into that stock. 
So those are some examples of absolute returns versus relative returns. I think uh, certainly relative returns will become important if you are ever looking back and saying, you know, should I have just bought the index? But uh, trying to predict what the future performance of an index is going to be from today, I think is near on impossible. Uh, I'm sure it will do pretty well, but who really knows? So um, when it comes to my own investments, I have hurdle rates in place at which I'll buy into businesses. And those hurdle rates are designed around absolute rates of return. So around earning 15% a year or around trying to get a double in three to five years or a triple in three to five years if it's more of a, a deep value, Pabri, Ben Graham type investment. So um, do I have a focus on beating the S&P 500? Not directly. If I think I can make a good re absolute return, I think the chances of beating something like the S&P 500 are pretty likely, but uh, it's not a direct focus when it comes to buying businesses in the stock market for me. So that's it from me for this one. Uh, if you did enjoy the video, please hit like and hit subscribe. If you've got any thoughts or comments on this whole absolute versus relative return discussion, uh, definitely drop them down in the comment section below and I'll be sure to get back to you. But that's it from me for this one and I will see you in the next video. Cheers.